Hey, are All you right. in Detroit? Are you in Detroit? You better believe it. <laughs> He's a liar. How did I know? No, okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, before we jump to this podcast, I know we don't have a ton of time. But we do something called the Over the Top Intro. I want to sing your praises before every podcast gets started. Is that okay with you guys? Oh, Sam, sorry, we're losing you. Uh, what about now? Can you hear me? Good. That's good. Yeah, like I was saying with this podcast, I don't know if you guys know, this is um, one of the things we like doing is called the Over the Top Introduction. And what we like to do is sing your praises before we jump right into this podcast. If that's okay with you guys, let me butt yeah. your bread a little bit. Is that all right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest are award-winning actor, producer, directors, and what is a self-proclaimed ice cream enthusiast? If we have time, we'll find out what that means. We are here <laughs> to talk about Los Angel, the genius of Judy Seal in theaters and on Amazon and Apple TV, April 12th. They both take you on a 90-minute journey to unearth one of musicals' greatest underrated geniuses. And they both highlight a reverberating effect that Judy Steele still has on the music industry today. Andy Brown, Brian Lestrom, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Sam. That was great. Brian, what ice cream is your favorite <laughs> flavor? Chocolate chip, and I'm old school, and it's hard to find now. <laughs> I, I I just want to keep this short. I'm a mint chocolate chip guy. Uh, always yes. the weird guy, but <laughs> man, it tastes good. Granted, it does taste like I it does taste like toothpaste, but it's so good. <laughs> but let's get into it, guys. Yeah, I just want to rip the band-aid off. How did you discover Judy's music? It was. Uh, it started with an interview I read from Andy Partridge of XTC, and he had mentioned her influence on him. This was around 2000, and I downloaded some Nap from Napster some bootlegs. Her albums had then got re-released. They were out of print for many, many years. Uh, a couple years later, and then YouTube started, and a video of her performing the Kiss on Old Grey Whistle Test appeared, and it really just slayed me and i showed it to brian a, a year or so later and then brian do you want to take over yeah and then uh i it was the last day of a sound mix on a documentary i was making and i i went to pick up my friends because my friend michael howells had babysat them uh, my kids my friend michael howells had babysat them that day and he said hey why do you make a film about judy sill <laughs> And I thought about it, and then Andy and I started to kick around the idea. And the first thing we needed to do was to make sure that no one else was already making it or had made one. And turns out no one had, and we just kind of went for it. And uh, there was a great booklet uh, made for the uh, release of her posthumous album, Dreams Come True, by Pat Rokes and Pat and Thomas, uh, a booklet. And that booklet basically became a kind of template for people for us to interview. And in December of 2013, we went to LA and interviewed a lot of those folks and just kind of that started the process. Took 10 years, Sam. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Not nonstop, not nonstop, but I mean, it, it did take that long. Now, I'm very curious. Like, how do you tell the full story of Judy with not a lot of ton of footage? It, it's... This is new territory for me, but so how do you tell this story? And I'm sure it's a lot of me's out there. That was the puzzle we had to solve because of that fact that there was very little archival material and we didn't add all that much to it, but we were able to get her uh, journals and and um, drawings and in, in, in about four years into this. And that allowed us to... That, as well as the fact that we found an audio cassette of an hour-long interview she gave in her own voice telling her life story. So her voiceover largely is, in the film, is largely her from up to 1972. And then we have a voiceover actress being Judy from 73 to 79 when Judy died, based on the journal entries that we had gotten. So we were able to have Judy tell her own story, which is what our goal was all along but we needed to be able to find the archive 
in a way to allow us to do that. And thankfully we did. The animation in the film is based on her drawing style from her journals. So we, we created animation based on Judy's own drawings. And then the soundtrack is the stems, the multi-tracks from her second album. So Judy is in fact scoring the, the movie okay. as well. So that was sort of our goal uh, was to have Judy, as if Judy were making the film to some degree. And we, as much as possible, wanted to make a film that Judy herself would have liked. And I think we'd like to think she would have liked it, but sadly we don't know, but I think she'd be tickled <laughs> uh, enormously. One thing yeah. about this, with the use of animation and sound over and her scoring her own story, um, how was it to stay true and keeping her legacy alive? Because if you read the Wikipedia stuff, she seemed dark and gloomy. However, when you listen to the interviews, she was like the light of the party. So how how was that meeting of those two worlds? Great point. That is a great point. You know, when we... uh first interviewed people about Judy in 2013, her dear friends, they all said just what a light Judy was, you know, that she was a person who lit up any room she was in. She was fun to be with. She was a dear friend and very loving, you know. That the, they could, the, the funniest person they knew. Yeah. And they could all tell stories about like, you know, she loved to give people gifts and she always wanted to celebrate their birthdays and holidays together. And you know, she was a very loving person. And uh, this was like completely uh, antithesis to what you'd read in Wikipedia, you know? So we were we were really determined to kind of make a film that honored who Judy was and, and in her own words, like let the audience understand, you know, the fullness of her character. But there was of course a dark tragic yeah. aspect to that, that she was brutally honest about. So she contained both those sides. But if you, you're right, if you just read the Wikipedia, she's the female Nick Drake. She's this dark figure and, and no, none of her friends agreed with that characterization of her at all. I love that reference, the Nick Drake reference, but yeah, it's, it's like going into that. And it, there's a lot in this 90 minutes that you uh, put in there, but going through her journals and going through her story, what would you say was like the toughest scene to shoot in a documentary? Hmm. You mean toughest emotionally or just to get right in terms of her story or Both. what do you mean? Both. I would say maybe handling her death, you know, how to communicate that, where it should be in the film, you know, all those things. You know, how, how how deeply do we want to go into the suicide, not suicide aspect of it? You know, back in those days, uh, no one thought of addiction as a disease. And, you know, if you died of a drug overdose, they just stamped suicide on the death report. Um, you know, we really wanted to get that right. Um, but also the opening of the film was a real challenge for us, too. You know, I think we probably tried every possible <laughs> Opening close, you know, I can't think of a, an idea we had that we didn't try. You know, we really wanted to make sure that things were where they needed to be. Okay. The, 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 the process of making the film was, was very collaborative. So we tried everything. And you really, if you're going to collaborate with somebody, you really need to respect each other's ideas because even if you don't think something is a good suggestion, I was proven wrong so many times because we tried it, it was like oh yeah that does work and i think that you know is partly why it took a long time as well to make the film is that we tried everything you know each other's suggestions that includes our executive producer peter kenny his suggestions and, and absolutely includes our editor michael ward who sure. the three of us having a threesome in a way created a two to one vote that sped things up or in, and made things efficient in a certain way too so well, throughout this documentary, you guys had a who's who of the music industry. Let's just put it like that. And it's going to take me way too much time to name all the people who were in here. I'm curious, who was the easiest and who was the hardest to interview? Um, 
Nobody well, was that hard, really. Everyone was grateful and happy to do it, right? I mean, when there, you think there was a real sense of uh, of mission of like people wanting to do their part in helping kind of right what they perceived as a wrong, which is that Judy in her lifetime, you know, her music never kind of reached the audience that they felt it so deserved. And that includes David Geffen. Absolutely. Who objected to the Wikipedia version of his role in what happened to Judy. And he wanted to set the record straight about that. Sure. Okay. Now I know I'm up against it. So I only got a few more questions left guys. Sure. Um, you guys had a 90 minute documentary um, highlighting one of the geniuses or lost geniuses of <laughs> what changed my view on how music was at that time. What was left on the cutting room floor? I can only imagine there were some things that was left out of this documentary that you wanted to put in or something you feel that could have, you could have elaborated a little bit more about. Yeah. One thing that uh, I wish we had time for um, is uh, there's a wonderful guy named Bill Botticher, who was a classmate of Judy's at LA Valley college and uh, in the music department there. And he was the one who recorded Judy's first known recording, which is Poor Tender Maiden's Lament, um, which is in the film. But what's not in the film is that that film won a songwriting contest. And the song won, the song won a songwriting contest. Yeah, yeah. The, song, the song won uh, uh, the college's songwriting contest and it uh, really meant a lot to Judy and kind of gave her a lot of momentum. Um, but it, we just couldn't make it fit in the film. And so, you know, we felt it was more important that the, the song is in the film, but the whole story isn't, you know. Right. But she was 19 years old. It was the first song that she had written and she entered a contest with it and she won the contest. So that five years later, when she was kicking heroin in the in the jail in L.A. and decided that if she could do that, she could become a singer songwriter. Mm. It started with that song that she wrote. And then four years later, she was on the cover of Rolling Stone. Four years after kicking heroin in That's prison awesome. and deciding to become a singer songwriter. So it was pretty meteoric after that point. But well, the talent was there. Well, I got one more before we um because I'm up against it. Sure. Um, guys, what do you want the audience to take from this film? That Judy's music meant was meant to heal people, and that despite the struggles she went through, she uh would be just so delighted to know that people are listening to her music now and that it is offering healing its healing powers that she intended as part of her mission are working for people and uh, we hope that the movie that the our film spreads that music music to a wider audience and then i would just piggyback on that by saying um you know i think judy sill was a, a superstar whatever word you want to use and just because maybe she didn't reach the the audience numbers that other people did the way that her music transforms people uh, is just really meaningful and rare. And uh, it's made me kind of reevaluate what, what kind of litmus test we use to determine if someone in the industry made it or not. You know what I mean? Like you, you can't listen to the kiss and think that this is anything other than someone who completely scaled, you know, the heights of, 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 of artistic expression. Well, guys, I know, uh, we had time. Uh, I, I wish I had more, but you got Andy, Brian, you are welcome back anytime. This was an excellent documentary. Thank you for just chopping it up with us for a second. And um, I wish you guys much success and you're welcome back to the podcast whenever you want. Thank it was you a so pleasure, much. Sam. Thanks. Go Lions. Oh, yeah. Lions. <laughs> All right.